Thank you very much. Usually I'm not introduced for being a woman, but I guess that's the case. So I do, a, I am actually a woman, yes. So <clears throat> uh, I've been working on artificial intelligence for uh, 33 years or almost uh, all my life. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit and uh, my talk is going to aim at some technical level and so that everybody understands a little bit more of what's being, uh, what's being an AI system. So um, basically within these uh, AI goals, uh, it can be captured as Alberto actually also mentioned and, and Paul and we, it can be captured as this integration of the ability for machines to perceive the world. So this concept of processing data, uh, think about what to do with the data, achieve accomplishments, achieve objectives, and actually do them. So this combination of perception, cognition, and action is what is this uh, intelligent agents of idea. And we can include in this uh, perception all sorts of different uh, uh, oh, sorry, uh, cognition, uh, the representation, the planning, and action, the motion, the speech, the gesturing. But this is like your homework for today, is understanding that in some sense AI or robotics, intelligent robots have this capability of integrating these three capacities. So I've done many robots, intelligent robots, that's what I do every day, that's what I was doing yesterday before I came here, I was like working on them, I'll be doing them I mean, working on them when I go back very uh, tomorrow or whenever. Uh, but the point is that today I'm just going to talk about these specific ones that are these cobot robots. And these cobot robots have this appearance, they have some kind of mobile and they basically have a computer on board and they are, have s cameras. So for you to understand where we are, so these robots actually escort every single visitor uh, who does not know where my office is, uh, is met by this robot at the, the actual elevator and the robot uh, comes to my office and escorts the visitor. And here is a video of Eric Horvitz actually from uh, Microsoft Research being escorted to my office. And Eric very generously gave me his, this video. Not all my visitors, more than hundreds have come, but there's Eric. And basically Eric was met uh, uh, at the elevator by Cobot and then Cobot says follow me and here he goes Cobot and Eric follows the robot and eventually there is all these types of like challenging sensing uh, environments, glass walls, all sorts of large spaces and the robot goes and uh, eventually gets to my office which I'll just, I'll uh, see you, I'll show you turning and there's the robot turning and eventually my office is at the end of that corridor. And you just follow this. So I, this is an invitation and a, a, to come and visit me at Carnegie Mellon and Cobot will be able to escort you, which is a, quite an appeal. Many people come to visit, I guess just to be escorted by the robot. They don't care much about me, but they really care about the robot. And that has been uh, the case. And there's me at the end of the corridor. I'll let you just see my office if you want. As, as you are not there, there's my office and there's me. Anyway, so, uh, and Eric, and everybody comes escorted by this robot. But now like the homework here, or like the little bit of the work here in this talk is to understand what's happening with this robot. How does it move? How does it know where it is? Uh, for, some, for all of you should know that inside of the buildings, there is no GPS. So there is no, uh, universal coordinates the robots can sense inside the buildings. So the great challenge from a technical point of view is how do they move? And they are not stopped and they are supposed to move in any, in any building. So cobots move in the Gates building where my office is, but they also move uh, in any building. The Nolan Simon building, they move uh, in New York. I was in New York, I'll show you a video. So, that's, so what is this all about? How do these robots move? And I don't have time to ask questions and wait for you to answer, but I'll tell you. I mean, if I were like here, I would say, how do you think, how do you think? But unfortunately, I don't have time for that. So let me explain to you. They have sensors, okay, sensors, cameras. They have a very special camera, which is a, this camera called the Connect, which is a depth camera. And so, so you understand what this is all about. It's a camera that gives the robot, the computer on the robot, 
a 3D view, a 3D, which means that uh, the, the cat camera passes to the computer what we call a point cloud, a cloud, but that has nothing to do with a cloud. It's just a bunch of numbers, a cloud, a big kind of area, and looks like this. A lot of these points, and what is this like for, for you to understand what this is remarkable is that instead of giving the color of every single pixel in the image, it gives the depth, the distance. At what distance does the ray, the intensity light ray, the infrared came back? So it builds this map of where the obstacles are, builds a map of where these things in the environment, how far they are from the robot. And that enables robots basically to move because they now know where's the open space and eventually they know where the walls are and they, we, by using that information from a computer point of view, you can produce commands to keep the robot in open spaces. Do you understand? Yes, perfect. So here is like the, the challenge, and I'll explain to you. It's given an image of this type, so the robots do, these robots in particular do not see uh, like uh, they don't read the signs on the, the doors, on the office doors, they don't see doors, they don't see anything. They just have this gigantic matrix of distances. This image is a, what we call a raw image. This type of colors, it seems that it's white and black, but it's no, it's a grayscale. And the grayscale kind of captures how far things are. So there are things that are really far away, there are things that are closer, and that's what it is. In fact, the connect misses things at 60 centimeters, so that's why here it doesn't do very well. And so the challenge is how do you connect these, the, the, the view of the robot, to a map that the robot might have. So here is like your uh, robot localization in one slide, so that you'll get, this is a PhD thesis of Joydeep Bismarck, but it's in one slide, and you are all going to get a, a PhD at the end of this slide. So let me try to explain to you what's happening. So basically, there is a map that the robot has represented in a representation, like Paul was saying, AI systems have knowledge representation. What is this thing of a map? A map is really just a lot of geometry that tells at which distance walls are. It's a line, this is what we call a vector-based representation. It's all vectors, it's all geometry. And basically the robot uh, internally has an estimate a probabilistic estimate of where he thinks it is. So these little multiple circles, orange circles, means that the robot does not know exactly the X, Y location in the map where it is, but has an idea with a distribution of probability of it's around there. Do you understand? And now, as it moves, as it moves, this robot is getting information from the environment. So it's seeing, so it knows how much it moves through its wheels, the commands, but then it also sees. And so these robots basically go around and here is the, the, the point cloud and they see people. And then magically here, this moment is fundamental because uh, these kind of like green and yellow, it's instead of a gray color, a color depth a map, doesn't matter. But there is this beautiful area here, which is vertical. And the robot distinguishes that as a wall. And as soon as it sees that wall at that distance, it matches to its map. And it's going to say, well, if I see that at that distance, I probably, I'm here. And as it goes on, it, then it has an even more remarkable moment, which is the moment in which it sees, oops, sorry, in which it sees the corner. That particular corner, you are going to see here if I manage to stop this, but as you see the red thing there is matching and it sees this corner. And as soon as it sees the corner, its uncertainty reduces to zero. And beautiful, the robot knows where it is. And as you saw, the circles, these red orange circles are now collapsed. The robot knows its position really accurately and then it plans its actual motion such that it keeps in this corridor. Do you understand? Very beautiful, very beautiful algorithm, very difficult to do this reliably. And so Joy Deep Pizvaz, the student of mine who did this, is a genius. And it was invented a new algorithm to be able to do this. And here is the robot that I'll show you at CNU moving. You saw it uh, escorting uh, 
a, um, a visitor and here it's moving completely in empty space and look from a sensing point of view how challenging the, 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 the looks are. Look at this gigantic kind of light coming into these cameras from this um, uh, glass bridge and it was in an open space. Then eventually there is this transition between the wooden floor and the carpet and there is a bump in that transition and the bump is not very good for the, the robot hardware, so we tell the robot to actually slow down. Look how beautifully it knows that it's in that place and slow downs automatically, exactly in the right X, Y location. And then eventually it goes on. You understand? So what you have to appreciate, you cannot look, after this conference, you cannot go and look at a robot move around, if you see any, and just think, oh, it's so fun. No. It's about understanding how much it's behind in terms of technology of what's there. Do you understand? Now you know how robots move. They move, they sense, and eventually they can find these walls and they can know where they are. This is Joy did this was on the left. Okay, so these robots also are amazing data collectors because they move in the environment and they actually know where they are in the map. They are able to assign whatever sensed quantity they are sensing to exact positions in the map. Here is the robot collecting data on Wi-Fi signal data. So the robots are capable of producing these um, very accurate map maps of the vitals of the building, temperature, humidity, Wi-Fi, noise level, pollution level, anything. So also, we are not used to think this way, but when we hear about autonomous car, cars, we all think about the jobs that will be like, uh, the, the taxi drivers will be gone, or some kind of like problem with jobs, but we also don't understand the amazing opportunity that it will be for an autonomous car to be moving in our environments and collecting data about the pollution, about the temperature, very accurate map, data, uh, maps. So my thesis, my student of my thesis, Richard Wang, was also all about looking at robots as mobile data collectors. And in fact, we humans have a very hard time knowing our position. If you tell me that the zero, zero of this space is somewhere in that corner, I have a hard time, my brain is not good at computing the exact coordinates of the point where I am. We have kind of meters and we have kind of like rulers. Otherwise, I can guess maybe, I don't know, minus three and plus, I don't know, 25 meters, or I don't even know if I'm guessing right. But the robots are amazing in terms of knowing their position. Very beautiful also. Because now they actually can generate for us very accurate maps of quantities we might be interested in finding out, okay? Second thought, so the first one, they move by themselves by seeing these walls and mapping to maps. Uh, first thought, the second thought is that they are mobile data collectors. And here are, for example, examples of temperature maps that they have created. The third thought, which is hard to say, for, I mean, I'm not going to be able to explain to you, they're actually able to generalize and navigate through some episodic non-Markov localization, again, Joy Deep's thesis, on any environment. So this is a very different scenario. It's, there are these cubicles, it's all different, and there is nothing that uh, um, this robot cannot navigate. As soon as you provide a PDF map of the building, if uh, I had brought Cobot, you could have seen Cobot move around in this building easily, by just providing the PDF map. So why do I tell you this? It's important for you to understand that sometimes a lot of the AI and the robotics is a single demonstration of in a particular place, and it lacks this capability to generalize. It lacks the capability to actually uh, solve more than one problem. And in this particular case, a lot of my research has been on having these mobile robots go anywhere not just there, but you know, they don't do more than just go. They are basically things that go from place to place, know where they are in the map, but they cannot scramble the eggs, they cannot play squash, they cannot do anything except 
going from place to place, which is also something that you have to understand. These AI systems, these robots, are very narrow in the scope of the tasks that they perform. They are not like these humans, like we are, that seems that we can do it all. I mean, uh, and so we are very, very broad in our uh, intelligence and in our functioning. So these robots have moved at TMU for more than a thousand kilometers, which is kind of a remarkable accomplishment because you can think, oh, but uh, you know, how did they move? They move autonomously. Nobody follows them. Nobody actually remote operates them and they just move in all these environments by themselves, wherever they are needed, or even wander around in our environments, and they add up all these kilometers. So one thing, though, that you might have noticed is that they do not have arms. They are just these column with a laptop on top and some kind of like wheels. And so they, they actually cannot manipulate objects, which is a very beautiful capability of robotics, manipulate all in these factories and everywhere, there's a lot of robotics to manipulate. But when they move, we really don't need as much our arms. So instead of arms, they actually have something that's very nice, which is a basket. Baskets are really good. So, you know, are really good. And I cannot patent a robot with a basket, but I really think that it was a major invention that we did at CMU, was to put a little basket on these robots. So, but they cannot put things in the basket and they also cannot press elevator buttons. So when I tell you that they went like on these, uh, I didn't tell you, but there are nine floors in the buildings or in, among buildings, you can say, how do they go up these, uh, these elevators? And some of you more internet of things oriented might think, oh yeah, they could be connected to the elevator system. And they could, but they are not. Uh, these ones in particular, and the re I mean, they, and they could. They just cost a lot of money to connect, and we didn't have that. But even if you say, why aren't they connected to the elevator? They could be, but then you can, I wonder, would they be able to open all the doors of the world? And some of you, the purest machine learners, like I'm all a machine learner, oh, they couldn't learn to open any door. Really? Any door? I didn't practice to open these doors when I came, I'm telling you. I was able to open all these doors, phenomenal. A robot, I don't know. So there is this thing that took my sleep at night uh, many years ago, or it still takes my sleep at night, many things, uh, is this concept that robots have limitations. AI has limitations. It's not really this thing that people say that can do it all. And it's not about this, especially robots. My God, it's so hard to have them move, to have them see, to have them think, to have them actually Someone claimed they don't think, Alberto, I think. They do, but that's okay. So, uh, uh, so uh, we can discuss this later. But, uh, but the point is like this, it's hard, but they have limitations. So one day, I believe it was around 3 a.m. or something, uh, I was like struggling with these cobots that would not move in uh, our buildings, and I decided that after all, it's going to change. We are going to change this robotics paradigm and have robots ask for help when they cannot do things. And it changed the paradigm, the ability to have robots in our environments ask for help. So how do they take the elevator easily? They go to the elevator hall, and I don't have sound, but it doesn't matter because there are like legends, and they just shout to the air, and they say, can you please push the up button and hold the elevator door. <laughs> literally, I mean literally, as we speak, there might be a cobot in the seventh floor wanting to go to the ninth, the fourth, and it just stops there, has no clue if there is people around, but just says, can you please? And there is always a generous human that says yes, and eventually, look, the robot goes in by itself, beautifully, all holds the door. This is Stephanie Rosenthal that did a lot of studies with humans helping the robots. But, uh, and that's uh, her PhD thesis. And then it's inside and it says, can you please press eight and let me know when I'm there. And the human nicely says, you are there and the robot goes. So that, that, that piece of its own task cannot do it yet. Maybe I buy an arm and have the robot push the button. In fact, I've done, I mean, we have a little arm that pushes the button. Maybe, you know, we connect to the internet. Uh, to the elevator, maybe, we, whatever. 
The point is that there will always be something that the robot might not be able to do. So now, in order to deploy this robot as autonomous, we have to enable the robot to say, I can do this, someone needs to help me. So you can ask, like, what happens if nobody helps the robot, right? I'm not following it, it just goes. What happens if nobody follows the robot? What happens if someone steps in front of the robot and doesn't let the robot go? The robot says, please excuse me. Nobody gets out of the way. It's there. What happens if someone like unplugs some camera from the robot? What happens if, what happens? What happens is that the robot sends us email and it says, I have been blocked by an obstacle for more than three minutes. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I've been blocked, come in, rescue me, right? So what happens is that you actually that are blocking the robot, you don't know that it sent us email. But magically, we appear in front of the robot, we appear there and we say, hey, come on, what's happening here? Let the robot go. You know, and so this happens a few times, not often, but you have to understand that that's it. Completely you are, I'm in the middle of giving a talk and I might receive email from Cobot. I'm stuck there, nobody presses the elevator button. Okay, well, big deal. I just actually, it happened once that I was teaching a class and in the middle of teaching a class, I got this email, I told my class, hey, hold on a second, I have to go and help the robot on the fourth floor. <laughs> and I left, five minutes, three minutes, came back, oh, okay, we'll go on. So very easy. Uh, uh, because anyway, so did look at the beauty, I mean, you, it's, int it's interesting, but look how it changes the AI landscape. They can't do it all. That's fine. They ask for help. Here is an example of going to the web. So you can say to the robot here, uh, please, please bring a coffee to the lab. I don't know the, this object is not in my knowledge base. and the robot says, I don't know what coffee is. I don't know where's coffee in this building. I'm going to find out from the web where coffee is. If it's uh, in a bathroom, in a printer room, in an uh, office. And eventually the, 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 the web says that coffee is with high probability in an office or in the kitchen. And the robot asks, where should I go? And the human says, go to the kitchen. I think it's in the kitchen. And now the robot actually says, I will collect this coffee from the kitchen. And I'm going to the lab, which is 7412, and it just goes. So now I wonder, how is it going to get coffee from the kitchen? Ask for help. There we go. So nothing here it can't do. So there it is at the kitchen. Again, in this particular case, Mehdi Samadhi was there. Hello. Hello. Could you please put the object coffee in my basket and tell me when I can go? But if this happens all the time, it stands in front of you, can you please put the, bo uh, the object book in my, in my basket and tell me when I can go? Please give me like a, the object package from Amazon on my basket so I can go all the time. Now, and then it goes. But so again, like that much that didn't do. The difference between this and pushing the elevator button, the help that it asks for knowing where's coffee is that it learns. So all the cognitive limitations, it actually learns, accumulates all this knowledge. This is on purpose so you cannot understand, it doesn't matter. But there is some internal representation again, like the map, but now it's an internal representation of this knowledge that through some uh, interaction, either talking with people or going to the web or whatever, everything that's like, I don't know where the lab is, and we say 7412. It stores, it remembers, it counts how many times we say this. It has a distribution of the much, how much you used, where you used, who used. So it has all this learning. So now if you go to CMU actually, and you see a cobot and you ask something, it's, it's a coffee to the robot, the robot does not need to go to the web. Now it knows where it's coffee. But if you say also, go to Professor Veloso's office, go to Manuela Veloso's office, go to uh, Manuela's office, Nobody entered that information up front. It was learned through interaction with humans, through interaction with the service. So it does not learn to press the elevator button when it asks for help because it doesn't grow an arm just by getting help. But everything else at the cognitive level, these robots started tabula rasa, not knowing anything about the, the building. It knew the X, Y locations of office, but it did not know anything else but it, through this interaction, it learned anything, it just saved. 
Do you understand? This is really interesting because the robot, we don't have to worry about the robot starting from scratch, knowing everything. It just acquires it as it goes. Now, this is also very important for us to understand because these learning machines, these machines that can learn, we are not used to learning machines. When we buy a refrigerator, the refrigerator freezes the first day we buy. It always works. That's not good. We should start buying refrigerators that don't work the first day. And then we kind of teach the robot, he ordered the refrigerator, here is where I like to put my eggs. This is what I like to have in the freezer. And the refrigerator would learn how to optimize whatever his temperature settings are for our use of the refrigerator. So we have, unfortunately, technology that always works. Our car, we buy a new car. When do you start a car and the car doesn't work? Hey, that would be great. What if we had to teach the car? Every time I do this, that means that I would like the motor to start having fuel and so forth. Fantastic. And it would learn by interaction. Robots will have to learn by interaction with humans. You are going to buy a robot, comes home, does not know where your socks are, does not know where's the newspaper, nothing. No problem. What matters is that you have to have an ability to teach this thing, this AI thing, to eventually do what you think that should complement what it comes to do. I do not teach the robot to move. I don't know what current to send to its four motors. I don't know how to process the image. Many things it comes already equipped with, but eventually that's not enough to have the complete AI system that performs the task. So there will be something that will be built in and there will be other things that we have to complement. So we invented actually a way also to, to actually have humans teach the robots by instruction. So this is a little technical again, but you can actually teach the, 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 the cobot to do things. You can say, uh, when you see this landmark, what should I do next? Then you turn these many degrees and you have, we have a language to talk with the robot, complete natural language, a little bit codified. So it's not like, oh, go there. You really have to still talk a little bit robot language, but you do not have to program in Python or in Java or in anything. You just speak. We transformed it into what's called an instruction graph and the robot executes what you said. This is also major in terms of extending these robots. And here, for example, is Baxter, a manipulator robot, executing uh, all things that we have instructed through language that become instruction graphs that are compiled into the robot primitives. And all of this becomes a new way to interacting with AI systems and robots because you will not need to program. Eventually, we are going to be only, you are going to be able just to speak to this. And the final thought that I'm going to, to tell you is that it is a little bit of a disturbing moment, the moment that the robot appears in front of your office and literally you did not see where it came from. And there is this thing about the robot that is different from our cell phone, which is somewhere, or our laptops. These cell phones don't move. And they basically are under, always under your view. The robot disappears from your view. And so there is always this question about these questions that it comes with like this. What are you going to do next? Which path did you take? What happened by the elevator? How long did it take to arrive here? Did you success, successfully get to the lab? Why are you late? So now we have this creature that moves around, and now this is, the, the research, this is what, in fact, is the biggest problem with AI and, 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 uh, and autonomy, is this transparency. And I can write code to find out answers to all these questions. But the problem is that we actually have not yet generate, we don't have these AI systems and robots generate answers in English, in Portuguese, in language to humans. Especially look at this, the question, why are you late? It's very hard <laughs> because the robot, you know, how does it find out what is this thing about being late? I was supposed to be here, 3 p.m. Is 3.01 late? Is 3.05 late? 
is 4 p.m. late. What is this concept of human concept of late? I don't think 301 is being late. And I would not ask the robot, why are you late if you are milliseconds after when you were supposed to be here? So, and why? Now the robot has to actually know to blame some part of its reasoning to this additional two minutes. So now, just to finish, the robot's reason, like uh, I didn't tell you, but think about just numbers, tons of probabilities, distances, computation of like images, all sorts of like uh, uh, reasoning about the updates to their probabilities. And now we want to convert this, and let me show you. It reasons with maps, with coordinates of maps. Uh, minus 43, 303, the 16, this is a robot. It's all these numbers. And we want this robot to talk. So we actually invented this concept as from an experience that enables the robot to verbalize. So not visualization, which we are all full of data visualization, pie charts, colors, all sorts of like things, but verbalization. Our robots now can actually explain the routes they took by saying, I traveled 26 meters and took me 152 seconds on the seventh floor. Very useful. You know, I went straight for 15 minutes and turned left and straight for 51 meters and turned left and straight for 10 meters to reach the destination. Isn't it beautiful robot language? I really like it. Anyway, so I started from room 3201. I went through the 3200 corridor. Then I took the elevator and went to the seventh floor. Then I took the seventh floor bridge. Then I passed the kitchen. Then I went through the 7400. And then I reached room 7416. You know, this used to be science fiction in some sense to generate, generate this automatically. We are not yet there that they explain everything. Why are you late and so forth is the thesis of my student Vittorio Pereira. But the fact is that we are getting closer. And in particular, we invented also this space of multiple dimensions, abstraction, locality, specificity, for the robot to explain in different levels of detail. We also learn if a human says, please tell me exactly uh, how you got here, that the language exactly means some point in that verbalization space. And then, okay, tell me only what happened by that room. It's another point in the verbalization place. And then if you say, give me a brief summary, the robot goes to another point in the verbalization space and generates another type of verbalization. We are doing this also explaining scenes from a uh, vision point of view. Uh, I think I'm near the kitchen because I can see a microwave and a sink, all these through deep learning and trying to actually generate this explanation. And we are now also trying to, the robot can explain in which floor it is by actually looking at the image and finding the, 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 the identification of each floor and can explain, oh, I am in the fourth floor because there is a plant there. I went to the fourth because I saw that thing that was a discriminative kind of feature of that floor. Lots of complication. What happens now is that we are working, this is the last things we are working on, uh, about this transparency, this accountability, this ability to interact with humans in a way that humans trust machines more. So in conclusion, I want to mention that this human AI interaction is the new, uh, the new trend in terms of research. It used to be human computer interaction, or it is still, but where do you put the app, where you put like the menus and so forth? That's the human computer interaction. Then there is the human robot interaction that maybe do you like it more virtual, more embedded. But in general, there is this human AI interaction in which humans eventually request tasks, they provide the help, they can instruct, they can train, they can correct these AI systems. But there is a challenge also from the AI side to be able to do it all, integrate this perception, cognition, and action, do the tasks they are required to do, but then ask for help proactively, learn from this interaction, and eventually dialogue, learn, interact, and offer, offer, offer explanations. So this is where we are. This is what I hope that you understand when you read these more, uh, how do you say, philosophical uh, articles about the dangers of AI and robotics or the opportunities, at least 
uh, this is an opportunity. It was a, it was an opportunity for you to understand more what is like the reality as we speak of mobile service robots. Okay, thank you very much.